Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Strengthening Democracy Through Civic Leadership panel. Welcome, welcome, thank you, thank you for being here. I'm Sylvia Leger, I am the co-founder of uh, the Policy Circle, an organization's mission is to really engage women locally to take ownership of solutions. And today our conversation is going to be around strengthening uh, democracy through civic leadership and particularly ensuring that everyone is at uh, the table. And um, I, you know, as, as we know, uh, democracy depends really on, on citizens' engagement. Uh, in the last election, 66% of people voted. Um, a study shows that only 39% of Americans can name uh, the three branches of uh, government. And sadly, 20% of, uh, of people just believe that in Washington to do the right thing. So there is a need to really engage citizens and particularly to having women around the table. And I have wonderful guests today that I will introduce as, as I invite them to speak. Um, and I would like to start off with uh, Dambiza Moyo, who is uh, here, uh, from who is joining us remotely. Uh, Dambiza is a prize-winning author of several bestsellers, especially Dead Aid, and uh, recently, her most recent book is How Board Works. Uh, she's, she's on several uh, corporate boards and has been named one of the most influential women. Dambiza, I'd like to turn it to you talk from it, you've lived in 80 countries around the world, um, and I'd love your perspective on what are one of the key pillars of democracy, of strengthening democracy around the world, and especially about engaging women. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, I'm you know, really uh, sad that I'm not uh, able to join you in person on the panel, um, but the question that you pose, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, and in my previous book, um, entitled Edge of Chaos, I outlined not only what I see are two central problems um, with democracy, but really outlined also the manner in which, in fact, 10 ways specifically um, for us to solve the, the sort of fundamental weaknesses that are in democracies. Um, I think ultimately a successful democracy is incredibly important um, for not just uh, society writ large, but in particular, it also uh, is really important in terms of the success uh, for women. The, the two problems that I identified are um, one, short-termism, um, the fact that there is a schism or a split between um, economic societal problems that tend to be long-term and intergenerational um, against what are essentially short-term uh, incentives and short-termism that's embedded in the political system. Um, I won't delve into all the solutions I believe are important to addressing that, but fundamentally what this means is that you end up with a lot of uh, policies um, that are instituted by policymakers that seem perfectly reasonable in the short term, but over the long term can be incredibly damaging and undermine not just the economic environment, but ultimately also democracies. Um, related to that is the issue of participation. And you just touched on this. You mentioned that 66% of Americans voted in the last election. That is a far cry from what I think our goal for democracy should be. Um, around um, a greater participation for everyone. And in fact, back in the day, we used to say one man, one vote. Um, but really, the whole fight for universal suffrage and civil rights, um, I think, is, is quite undermined by really not having full participation um, by all citizens in the political process. It's also perhaps worth mentioning that although you mentioned that 66 percent of people participated, if you actually look at low-income citizens, that number is down to around 30 percent, which again, to my mind, undermines um, the, the need for, uh, uh, for a better and a stronger um, public policy environment. There are many other aspects that are important, but I think, you know, obviously you touched on education, um, understanding not just the branches of government, but actually how we can, what levers are available um, for all elements of governance, whether it's civil society or corporations, as well as government, to really effect change at particularly a time when the world is facing big challenges like climate change and inequality. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Namdiza. It's real. Thank you for your remarks. And it's interesting that you mentioned a corporation. On our panel today, we have Wendy Wood, who is a director and senior partner, vice chairman of social impact at Boston Consulting Group. And uh, she has the responsibility for BCG's work in sustainability, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, and total societal impact. And, and I invite you to watch Wendy's TED Talk on, uh, on total societal impact. And Wendy, love for you to explain what that is, because we hear a lot about corporate responsibility through education, to economic empowerment, uh, and to including women. And what do you mean and what do you counsel corporations to do in terms of this total societal impact? Okay. Well, Sylvie, thank you for that question and thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to join you all today. When we talk about corporations and successful corporations and businesses and investment opportunities, that really relies on companies thinking broadly. It doesn't rely on taking a narrow myopic look at financials, as Dimbisa says, in the short term. It requires organizations to think about all of the impacts that they have in the world and think about serving, of course, shareholders, but frankly, broadly, stakeholders. Because if corporations think broadly about, yes, their financials, but also their environmental and their climate footprints, the impact that they're having on participation, diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just diverse representation, but actually inclusion of the full work for, workforce, guess what? That makes for a much, much more successful organization, a successful business, and frankly, a successful democracy. So as we work with our clients, we really think about how do organizations bring full participation? How do they bring a full engaged workforce? How do they engage in their communities in a way that they're strengthening their communities? Their communities are strengthening them. We've been doing a lot of work on, on women and women participation. And the, the solutions for how we get uh, greater engagement of women in leadership, in business, they're, they're not shocking, they're not rocket science, but they, they've been too hard to implement. But honestly, at the crux of it, it's a lot about how do you have people feel included, appreciated, and give them a route to being engaged. All of the data says that when you've got an engaged workforce, an engaged employee base, right, they're gonna be twice as productive as an employee base that is not engaged, is not thinking that they're working for a, a purpose, a purpose beyond just the financials of the company. And so being able to offer that in a genuine way and being able to have individuals, all of your workforce, feel included, feel engaged, it's a route to productivity, but it's also a route to innovation. We, we did some data around women's engagement in leadership at boards and senior executive levels. Guess what? Those companies that have greater participation of women, greater innovative revenues, right? More successful companies, more innovation when they've got a diversity of leadership. They're bringing different viewpoints to the table. And so making sure that we've got full participation and not just representation, right? Because that actually isn't enough. You've gotta be able to bring people to the table in the way that they're willing to participate, that they can engage, they can contribute. Um, one, one personal example, and as Sylvie said, I'm with BCG. Um, as a company, we've been quite successful and we firmly believe in a, a democratic system. We actually have a one partner, one vote. We elect our CEO and every single partner within BCG actually has a vote for that. Um, we also work very hard at inclusion within our workforce. A um, couple years, a couple years, a decade ago, uh, we had a gap in retention between men and women. And we looked hard at it and we said, what are we, what are we doing wrong? Um, why do we have a few point gap between men and women retention? And it was some pretty basic stuff. It was about uh, women feeling like they had the, the supportive relationships at work. It, it wasn't about whether or not they could work part-time. We had that. It was about did they feel supported at work? It was a um, did they have roots to engage? And it took us a couple years, but for the last eight-ish years, we've had absolutely consistent retention between men and women. And so these things aren't hard to address about full participation. 
And when you actually bring the whole workforce, then it puts you in a position as a business, a corporation, to be a more successful business concern, but frankly, to have much better impacts on the world as it relates to climate and environment, and much bigger impacts on the world in terms of all of the social challenges that we're facing today. And it's about also just empowering uh, your employees, your associates, and then when people feel empowered and able to influence their environment, I think it translates into strengthening democracy because then Absolutely. you have the ability and the, and, the, and, the, and the confidence to engage locally and, uh, and actually participate actively and constructively to your local government. I'd like to invite now Carrie uh, Healy, Dr. Carrie Healy, who's the president of the Milken Center for Advancing uh, the American Dream. Um, uh, Dr. Healy has an interesting path where he also served as even governor uh, of the state of Massachusetts. And, uh, and then you are also a fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics and Center for Public Leadership. And you've served on several foreign councils. So you covered everything from the global perspective, the university, the, and then also state engagement. And now you're leading this institution of the American dream. Tell us, how do you define the American dream? Perhaps how you define it for women particularly? And why is it important to have a common definition uh, of this American, uh, American dream to strengthen our democracy. Well, thank you, Sylvie. First of all, thank you for having this discussion and engaging with women around civic participation. It's extremely important. Um, the American dream means something different to everyone. And so I would never sit here and say that there is one definition. And I actually would go further and say that it is an American, that it's the idea of America that has inspired people from around the world to come to this place because they believe that this is the place where they can have more agency, where they can control their life, where they could build a new life for themselves and their family through their own talents and their hard work without interference uh, by the government, either in, as Rick Scott was mentioning in the prior panel, uh, in, in their, in their uh, human rights, in their civil rights. And this is an ideal. It's not necessarily the reality for everyone in America, and we have to be very clear that not everyone in America right now, at this t moment in time, has an equal chance at the American dream. And we can break it down by zip code, or we can break it down by race or ethnicity, or by gender. And it's simply not the case yet. And so our center, the Center for Advancing the American Dream, uh, which is going to be in Washington, D.C., and open in two years, but we're starting to uh, beginning, begin our programming to uh, expand opportunity to as many people as possible very soon. Um, it's focused on closing that gap and giving people agency and hope to be able to achieve their dreams. And when you talk about different parts of society, one of the ways that people have traditionally achieved the American dream is through business through engaging in employment and creating their own businesses. And one of the most discouraging things that we've seen right now during COVID is that women's participation in the workforce literally went back 30 years, 30 years during COVID. And so all of the gains that occurred during my lifetime have been wiped out and it's beginning to build back. But at this current rate, it would take nine years to get back to the place where we were only a year and a half ago. And the same can be said, I'm afraid, for uh, in particular for business people of color uh, and, and especially women of color. And so we need now to redouble our efforts to change some of the systematic barriers that have precluded uh, equal participation in a number of areas, and in particular access to capital. And that's not a sexy topic normally. Access to capital sounds very boring. But if you get right down to it, uh, the reason why women are not participating in the workforce in, in equal numbers and, and doing as well as their male counterparts is because if they're going to become, for example, an entrepreneur, their access to capital is literally 3% of the total venture capital that's out there. And I've yet to meet a successful woman entrepreneur who didn't bootstrap who didn't start out with that. And fewer than 2.7% you know, of the, the women CEOs uh, get any kind of venture capital at all. And I know you're well aware of these numbers. And so, so we have to start thinking about, okay, how can we help people feel engaged, feel empowered, feel that they can take control of their lives? I talk to a lot of small business entrepreneurs um, as a part of my job, 
And it's very likely that if you're speaking to a woman or you're speaking to a person of color, the reason why they became an entrepreneur was not because of opportunity, but because of necessity. Right. Because they had been fired, because they felt that their income was too unstable, and the one thing they could control was if they themselves went into business. So we need to think very hard about how we support uh, women and, and people of color as they move back into the workforce at post-COVID, and I think that's the best way to help people begin to achieve their American dreams. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's. I'd like to. You know, we just have a few minutes, but. Uh, it's interesting that you know our conversation is leading us to economic empowerment, a business environment that fosters entrepreneurship, growth of businesses, inclusion of, of all types of workers. Dambiza, I know you know this is an area, especially uh, in in Africa, and that that you've looked at. Um, do you have a few words about around creating a business environment which empowers individuals? And, and therefore their civic engagement and participation in, in democracy. And perhaps in countries um, like Africa that, that have real problems with, you know, there's real challenges in development. You know, yes, I do. I mean, I happen to serve on the boards of a, a number of large global um, complex uh, organizations and I have done for 10 years. I also happen to serve on the um, Oxford University Endowment. And, you know, I don't think there's any big mystery as to why it is investors invest in certain regions and not in others. Um, and there are a whole host of questions um, that uh, I think are very transparent that we're not answering. Um, what's, what's the situation with the geopolitical environment? Is it safe? What about the legal environment? Is it rules-based or principles-based? And perhaps most importantly, if I can put it crudely, um, what do the returns look like? Not just financial returns, but also broadly ESG opportunities. Um, are we able to clear the cost of capital, um, et cetera, et cetera? And you know, the truth is, uh, and you know, unfortunately, not just um, in places um, as far flung as Africa or South America, have we failed to really answer um, you know, this, these questions in an attractive manner? But even within the United States, um, there are regions of the U.S. that are you know, essentially and, and unfortunately seen as, as largely no-go areas if you want to generate a, a positive return or you want to build a business. And you know, I, I, the good news is that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. I don't think this needs to be cryptic or difficult. Um, and, and I think, you know, fundamentally, we, we, we do need to have more constructive conversations about how we attract investment. We've done it before for millennia in, in, you know, in terms of trade and engagement across borders. I, I think that we complicate a lot of these things by having an effective government, but also corporations and organizations that can be, tend to be short term. Right. It's kind of a long term thinking. And I think I love like how, you know, our conversation went from uh, you know, from a, of a global perspective, but at the end of the day, I think it's it's really important to look at communities to uh, and and to empower in the citizens to really understand how their government, local government, has, has functioned. And I think during COVID, actually, this is one of the things that came out is people realize, you know, their county commissions have a lot of power, their school board have a lot of power, their state have a lot of power, and, and we need to go back and, and working uh, to understanding the powers and understanding how to influence and build out uh, relationships so that, so that we can, uh, people can feel empowered to have an influence and participate in constructive uh, solutions. Uh, so, you know, maybe we, have, we just have a minute left, Wendy, would you like to just share maybe last closing words and, and then, you know, from Keith? Uh, on that back. spirit of community, I would just go to the power of partnerships. Business can do a lot alone, but it cannot do everything alone. Governments, the exact same, or social sector, the exact same. And it's about how do we bring government and business and social sector together in collaboration, in partnership to make progress, because we're not gonna make progress the way we need to on COVID. We're not gonna make progress the way we need to on climate if all the actors are operating independently. But when we actually work together, the economics can work, the systems can work, and it works for communities and it works for all of us. And we need to have a common vision, a common dream of what is what are we trying to achieve. 
Um, Dr. Healy, do you want to give our closing 30 yeah, seconds? I, I, I'd statement? like to end on an optimistic note, yeah. right? Let's, 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 uh, and and, and to your point too. about uh, communities and women engagement, women's engagement in communities, one of the few really bright spaces that I've seen for women's participation uh, is, is the representation in local legislators, legislatures. So um, for many, many years, uh, per, women's participation in state legislatures across the country was stalled out at about 25%. And over the course of COVID, and it is has climbed to 29%. 29%. So I think that local engagement is truly a hopeful spot. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, we are ending perfectly on time. So thank you so much, Dambiza. It's wonderful to to meet you virtually, and I look forward to speaking thank again. You. Thank you, Wendy, <laughs> Dr. Healy. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.